Um, I want to talk, give you a brief high-level view of, of the transformation that, we, that has taken place in Borgash networks over the last two or three years, and maybe make some comments towards the end of my presentation on, 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 on water, because I think it's probably relevant. Um, as most people are aware, um, Borgash is the key, one of the key players in energy and gas in the, in the, in the country, um, and we own and operate all of the ROI infrastructure in terms of gas, both transmission and distribution. Uh, and as PJ has mentioned, um, we also own and operate both of the larger pipelines in North of Ireland, South, North and North West. And indeed, we operate the SNP pipeline as well, which is the Scottish Northern Ireland pipeline from our grid control centre in Cork. So, you know, we're a very important player on, on, in terms of gas infrastructure on the island. Clearly, we're, we're, our, our, our business is vertically integrated, so we're also into, into offering electricity and gas supply to customers on, our, on the other side of our organisation. Um, you know, we're a profitable company. We have a large turnover in excess of 1.3 billion and about 3.5 billion worth of assets. In terms of the scale of our networks business, um, you know, we're 2,500 kilometres of transmission main, over 10,000 kilometres of distribution main, um, many, many DRIs and AGIs. Uh, and I suppose it's worth noting that in, in 2010, um, you know, over 90%, 97% of gas coming into the island came through the two interconnectors. Um, we look forward to the advent of Corrib as another supply point onto the island, and indeed Shannon LNG when that comes to fruition. Um, I think a key stat, just for information, is that you know, we've noticed a, a continuing downward trend in throughput in the system, and year to date, this year compared to last year, total throughput is down about 26%, largely due to downturn in electricity generation, and, um, and obviously weather conditions being more favourable as well, and that does have an impact on throughput. So a few years ago, we, we looked at our business and, and looked at what we've done in the past and, and look f looked into the future. And we, we recognised the need that we, tra we needed to transform our business and how we, and how we did it. Um, our first price control period, 2003-2007, was largely focused on opening market and market reforms. Um, at that stage, we recognised that we hadn't invested a huge amount in IT, and we looked at the, the, the operating model that we had. And we, we did that for two reasons, to look at future challenges and, indeed, opportunities. And that's very relevant in the context of water. And we wanted to enhance, enhance our customer service experience, um, achieve overall efficiency, and clearly there's always downward pressure on tariffs, um, and to provide a better customer service. And also to look at our IT systems and reduce the risk on bespo some bespoke IT systems that we had in our organisation. So, um, we set ourselves a vision um, going back to 2008, 2009. Very simply, we wanted to make the vision statement very clear and understandable by our internal stakeholders and external stakeholders. Um, and and it, it looked across six planks of the organisation. We wanted to build a functional excellence organisation. Um, we wanted to look at our, our business partners and our, and our supply chain and put in next generation IT systems, optimise our standards and policies and focus on customer excellence. Um, and, and I'll refer back to that slide towards the end of my presentation to give you an update on, on where we think we've achieved in the last uh, two or three years. So we looked across what we consider to be best practice in the UK and elsewhere, uh, and came up with a, with a HPOM model, a high-performing utility model. And that's essentially a snapshot of the operating model that exists in networks today. Uh, and if you look at the, um, I, I suppose, the key uh, eight top or eight business processes that are there, which is manage, manage the asset infrastructure. And in creating that model, we had to create a whole new ma asset management organization. Uh, sorry. Uh, plan, manage, execute the work, uh, manage the customer, operate the network, uh, manage revenue and tariffs, very important, manage the meter, and we're going, undergoing a meter replacement program of about 70,000 meters currently, including a large-scale rollout of PPMs or pay-as-you-go meters. Manage our regulatory affairs, we're clearly a regulated monopoly, and also in our trading and settlements function. So within that, the other top level eight processes, if you like, in the business, but we, you know, su supporting those, we, we, re we rewrote about 500 processes in total across the entire organization. We also did a capability analysis back in 2008 of the systems that we had supporting those key processes. And as you can see there, we, while we were above basic in, 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 in nearly all of them, we were only at the threshold of what you consider best in class. Um, that's not to say the systems that we had, you know, they function certainly, um, but they, we wanted to take them to a level um, that were leading edge in most cases. Um, and, and, you know, that, that again compared what we had with best in class systems, both in the UK and elsewhere. So how do we go about our transformation? Clearly we put a structure together at the top level, a governance structure, and we empowered and pushed decision making down the tree uh, of that structure. Um, and and we, we, we broke it into three streams, if you like, business process and system implementation, 
organizational development, and then a look at our supply chain and how we structured our, our, our relationships with our business partners. Um, on the business process and system implementation, WAM FM, work and asset management systems, and field force mo uh, mobility. GTMS is the gas transportation management system in IOS, which is the old legacy system that we had. We focus a lot on business intelligence and managing the data coming out of our systems. And then also the fourth part of that was the delivery of handheld or field force technology into the field. We had to create a new organization, really. We had to map what we had, which was functioning, to what we wanted, which was best in class. And allied to that then, um, and, and, and to enhance our performance management framework, and, and put in a competency framework. So not alone was it what you did, but how you did it was equally important. And lastly then, we, want, we took a cold hard look at our business partnerships and our relationships with our, with our contractors and our supply chain. And that's a very, very busy slide, um, and, that, and that gives you kind of the various activities broken into time. I would focus on two or three things on it. If you look at the time we landed on our target operating model, which is May 2009, our systems from that period went live on the 1st of, of November uh, 2010, which is a very, very tight and aggressive timescale. Um, you will see that, that we, we, we phased our deployment um, over a number of months to de-risk um, rather than going live in our main systems and deploying the handheld and field force at the same time, we pushed them out into the early part of, of 20, sorry, the early part of 2011. Okay, I'll go on. So that was the first thing. The second thing is we took, we, in terms of our new contractor model, and I'll speak about that in a while, we, we pushed that out by 12 months because we didn't want to overload the organization in terms of the, the, the complexities of bringing in a new large wound contractor model with what we had in place at the same time we were going live with systems. So that was a fundamental de-risking of the thing as well. So coming on to organizational design, um, that was the structure that we had um, from 2008. Um, again, it's, it has served us well and, and that probably came into, into being in 2005. Prior to that, we were largely structured on transmission, along transmission and distribution lines. And while that structure was functioning and operating, we believed it wasn't the right structure to take the organization forward. So we, we looked at the HPUM model, um, looked at the various functions, put the building blocks together, and came up with various roles. Um, in, in, at the start of that process, clearly there had to be widespread staff engagement. So we set out some guiding principles at the start of that process with our staff, some of which would be, for example, that new roles would be advertised across the organization. And that would be one principle. The second principle is that if a new role was being introduced into an organization, and, and more than 50% of that role was already being done by somebody in the existing organization, and that person would map to that new role. And if that new role then um, engaged extra responsibility, that would be looked at in time post the go-live and implementation date of the transformation. So there were principles like that which were developed in conjunction with our staff and that we never varied off at all during the course of our transformation. I think that was important. And lastly then at the top level, um, that was the, 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 there were the four um, I suppose functional areas that developed out of, our, out of our transformation, which is asset, workflow, service delivery being the core, and then supported by the support function, safety, quality, health in the environment, and regulation and commercial. And very simply, the three core functions are most of the work originates in asset, driven by plan maintenance programs, investment programs, etc. Some of it customer driven. That flows through the chain into workflow where all the prerequisites are dealt with, um, detailed design, and then flows into the field. So if you like, the service delivery is the field part of that, pro of that, of that structure. Workflow progresses to detail design, etc. But it all pretty much originates either in asset or from customer-driven operations. In terms of the, the systems and the interaction between the systems, the legacy ones we had were IOS, um, which had legacy customer data, GPRN and billing. And we had our back office, Oracle Financials. And then we have a, you know, we believe to be a state-of-the-art GIS small world system in place. Um, the main system we brought in was a uh, maximum asset management system, a click scheduling and cycle of um, smart mobile in terms of the field, field force technology. And again, the call center agent desktop um, um, drawing its information from both iOS and asset, uh, the Maximo system. So Maximo, Cyclo and Click, clearly um, Maximo is office based. It holds all the asset data and um, estimates. It manages prerequisites. It holds levels of competency, so nothing, no work is dispatched to people who aren't competent to do it. Um, Click is a scheduling tool. We're now moving to work that's, auto, that's generated automatically to the system. So, for example, if somebody wants to fit a meter, that's put into the system. The work request is generated in Maximo. It's scheduled automatically in Click and goes into the field automatically down to the PDMs or PDAs in the field. So we're trying to generate that more, more and more of that automation. An example of that um, is how we execute our work. So work is dispatched um, through 
and scheduled through click and dispatch and received in the field. It's either accepted or rejected by the person in the field. Um, and again, the dispatcher can, can redispatch if it, if it, if it is uh, rejected. Person moves to site, and again, particularly in emergency response situations, it's very important to log when that person arrives in spite, uh, on site. That goes back into the maximal, into the system. Um, the, the status assessment is done on site when the person gets there. They begin the work, they execute the work steps, um, capture all the data around the assets. In other words, what is the fault mode, what's causing um, the, the, the fault in a piece of kit that's in the field. And that ultimately goes back in and is captured in Maximo. So what that has meant is that we're now getting a huge amount of data back into our, our central systems. And the challenge that we see now going forward is to make sense of that data and gather relevant information out of the systems to be sure that we're making appropriate and relevant decisions on, on, the, assets, on the asset base going forward. So I mentioned earlier just that that was our kind of revision and our strategy that we set out for a transformation. And just give you maybe an update on what we believe we've achieved. Um, and I'll start on the right hand side. We now believe have a structure that promotes fun functional excellence that creates many opportunities for our staff. Um, earlier this year we, we, we were designated um, and I believe to be the first semi-state to be done so to be a great place to work. Um, we have delivered our outsourced model contract, our large one, one contractor model, which probably most of you would realize is not, and seen in the press it's now bad for BTCLG. That was a big decision for us to take, but in reality what has happened is they've come in, they've got a strong balance sheet, B, Balfour BD have a strong balance sheet with local knowledge through CLG, and in reality they've taken on a, on a subcontract basis most of the people that are working in the industry anyway, so that's that. We have our next generation IT systems. We are standardizing our asset policies right across our asset classes, and we have a continuous focus on customer excellence. We have received um, numerous international customer service awards in the last two or three years. So we believe we've achieved a lot in, in terms of the vision that we set out for a business. Just in terms of our customer satisfaction, uh, we monitor our customer satisfaction trends a lot. Go back from that. Um, yes, sir, there you are. So you, you can see we've been monitoring our customer service performance from 2008 onwards, and, and we score quite highly in many of the categories. Mystery shopping and customer callbacks are licensed requirements. We do a lot of voluntary surveys as well and our performance generally is quite high at an acceptable level. Um, the, net the net promoter score um, is, is a concept that we started in 2010. And you can see interestingly when we brought our systems on in November, December and January, November, December 10 and January 11, and we took a dip in our performance around customer service. But happily, you know, it looks as if that trend is starting to come back up again and that would be largely expected um, when you introduce new systems. That's our asset management structure focused on strategy, investment management and asset programs. And again, this is an entirely new structure that we created in the organization. So it presents lots of opportunities for people that worked in the business. And you can see the various the functions that are, that, that are down from the top level. So now we have, we're writing policies, and, and if you like, and I, I, don't, I don't particularly like the term sweating our assets, optimizing the use of our assets, creating maximum investment opportunities in them, and making sure that they deliver efficiencies across our asset classes. And we're also, through that process, improving the control of them and managing risk to an acceptable level. So we have planned maintenance programs, integrated planned maintenance programs. We're modeling now asset segments and how they're performing. We're forecasting long and short term investment programs. Um, and we, you know, I suppose we, we are looking at, uh, at how the, the asset classes perform. In terms of the, the, the systems that we have in the field, um, we, we are now getting about 96 or 7 percent of our, our work orders back through our systems or PDAs. And as you can see from, from that's steadily rising across as we go through it. And that's that, that's that stat graphically illustrated there. So most of our work orders are coming back automatically, which obviously reduces the admin burden in the back office. Um, we have recently took occupancy of our new network services building a center in Dublin, which is our operational center of excellence for the, across all our Dublin operations. We were located in many different uh, areas, Sandyford, Browns Barn, and now we've centralized it all in one building, which was engineered local architect, Dublin architect, and engineered by Irish consultants. And that's, that was a 21 million investment, which is a strong statement of intent by the board in, in, the, in the networks business. Finally, Chairman, I just want to make some, some comments on Irish water. And, and I suppose it's, it's, it certainly has been a privilege, and is a privilege, for Borgash to be, to be tasked with the creation of, of Irish water. Um, we've certainly put a lot of work into, into looking at this in the last couple of years. And probably some of you are familiar with the process that's been undergone in the last number of months and since the middle of last year indeed when we made a submission to, to PwC. We've had engagement um, with the various departments, uh, culminating in the announcement then on the 17th of April 
uh, of the creation of Irish Water um, to be in, in Borgash as an independent subsidiary of Borgash Um I think, you know, for our organization, that's, that's a huge challenge. That was the vision that we put into our documentation submitted to the various departments to deliver sustainable, high quality and efficient water and wastewater services for the benefits of the citizens of Ireland. Um, this is an enormous challenge for us as an organization, but I think for the entire industry. I think the journey is going to take you know, a number of years. Um, I think we're going to be central in the delivery of the new organization, but I don't, I don't think we can and believe we can do it on our own. I think it's going to involve a lot of, of collaboration cooperation uh, between all the various stakeholders within the industry to achieve that vision. We will play our part. Um, I, I think the transformation that I tried to illustrate in my previous slides will certainly be on a scale, a multiple scale of what's in, what the ch this challenge presents. Um, we will certainly put, our, put everything we can in behind the creation of the new Irish water, again, to re realize that vision. And I'm confident and I hope that all the various stakeholders, government departments, local authorities and everybody else that's involved in the industry currently will play their part in achieving that vision for what is ultimately for the benefits of the citizens of Ireland. Mr Chairman, again, thank you very much for the opportunity to present and I hope we found it informative. Thank you very much.